And with that, I would like to welcome Walter de Brouwer to stage. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Very much appreciated. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, he, um, since a couple of months, I'm introducing myself as a computational linguist, uh, which I am, but for 25 years, I've not been able to do that because we were out of fashion. So when I left uh, university as a, um, <clears throat> as a lecturer there in computational linguistics, my audience had shrunk from 100 students to three. Uh, two of them I had to, you know, who were there the last year before. <laughs> uh, so, you know, whenever Marvin, Marvin Minsky wrote Perceptron, and this actually killed AI in the 80s. And <clears throat> for us who were in AI and natural language processing, who used Lisp, who were in the computer science department, which was part of the mathematics department, all our machine learning knowledge actually went to waste, or no, it isn't, but we just didn't go on. Luckily, somebody forget to tell Canada and they went on. <laughs> and um, so, and now it's a bit like, you know, your clothes, if you keep them long enough, they become fashionable, fashionable again. <laughs> so you see the education in the end, you know, proved to be uh, interesting again. And so, I'm, I'm starting with this slide from Westworld from Sunday, and where Ford, you know, Anthony Hopkins says, you know, basically, so do we really think we're so smart? And because this is a statement about carbon chauvinism or silicon racism. So, you know, we think, you know, that we have to put everything that we have into a machine. Now, just let us think of what this is. So this is 30 trillion cells, which express in 22,000 genes, which are, quote, 100,000 proteins into long chains of 22 amino acids. Shit, this is an energy money pit. You know, like, this is like using SAP on an MDAL and expecting to have an addition two plus two is four in two days. You know? So this is, this is not the ideal infrastructure you know, of what we are now having. So what can we do with it? We, well, our equations, we were very good in until seven numbers. We can't do compounding, uh, so we need machines for that. So we have five sensors, you know, for which we actually filter the outside world. So it's not so great. So as Kevin Kelly said in Inevitable, we have a very small intelligence in a very big galaxy of intelligence. Basically, we have pockets of vertical intelligence. Uh, so we're all good in a couple of things, and we have to refresh it. And luckily, we have you know, Google now, and we have our phone as a sort of a, um, uh, add-on memory. But are we, do we really want to put this in a machine? So, and, and let's see what these machines do now. Because actually, we are underrating uh, what machines do, and we are underrating that for a purpose. We don't want to scare people. You know, this is vertical intelligence. It is there now. Or as Kevin Kelly called it, alien intelligence, because artificial would mean that we want to mimic ourselves again. This is a Rubik's Cube, uh, Rubik's Cube you know, cube. It, you know, the machine does it in 300 milliseconds. Uh, it's, uh, of course, going into the Guinness Book of Records. Oh, needless to say, this will only be beaten by another machine. So this is a vertical intelligence. So this machine doesn't know, who is, we know which is the capital of France, or you know, when Elvis died, or you know, who, um, what love is, but it knows exactly how to do this, the best in the world. What we are, you know, let's look at what machines do otherwise. You see, this is a very nice picture. 98% of Americans do not believe that flies, uh, 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 planes fly by themselves. They do. So why are the pilots there? To taxi. So why can't the machine taxi the unions? Basically, 
who would step on a plane just flying by itself? So we are actually putting people at rest. We are dressing these people up. They cannot even touch the buttons. I saw the manual. This is a 777 Boeing. They cannot touch anything. So they are just sitting there. They are learning to taxi. So we dress up these people in a sort of a paramilitary outfit, give them hats, give them even, you know, stripes, uh, you know, just to, to see that this is the elite, you are in good hands, this is not the machine. So, and this is what people do when they are not in control, they customize, they give vestimentary attributes, give them tools so that we can recognize it, that it's not the machine, but human beings. See the tools? See the costumes? These people use machines that people like me and other people in Silicon Valley make, black boxes. And the black box says what the measurement is, and CLIA regulates it, and they just put us at ease. Now, can we, is it not the time to make a robo-doctor and to, to talk about robo-health instead of telehealth? Because telehealth, again, is not scalable. We have a worldwide shortage of five million doctors. Now it is possible to do robo-health, and let me tell you why. Six months ago, it was not possible. First of all, finally, you know, the big nine have open-sourced their machine learning. Admittedly, it's a bit like IKEA, there is always one piece missing. Uh, but, you know, we have a lot there. And it is, of, of course, embedded in the greatest invention after French fries, GitHub. You know? So we can go in there, we can try it out, we can put it all together, you know, and it's not even stealing because, ta-da, this is what we always wanted. This is, the bazaar, we built it in the cathedral. You know, if you remember Eric Raymond about open source. Uh, at that time in computer science departments, we were sitting on, on, on mainframes with Unix. We couldn't, when we left, we had nothing. We had to go back into the shed, you know, to work. So putting the bazaar in the cathedral is now open to anyone. We can all go. And citizen doctors. So, you see, we are looking for unlocked potential. You know, in Uber, in Airbnb. Think of the unlocked potential for healing in human beings. This is an organization called uh, Remote Area Medical. It's an American organization. And they, for 48 hours, they land somewhere in rural America and give healthcare for free. Uh, so this, you know, most of these people are not doctors. They're students, they're biologists, they help, because we have machines and the tools. So if we have intelligence built into a system, then we can scale. And you know, if the Vatican can do it, so I think AMA can also do it, because the Vatican now has lay priests. You know, like was, this was a big contention for a while, because we had to scale. And we have supercomputers now. You know, uh, we just bought this one. We pay $1 per core, $1 per graphical processor. So, because there's four Titan X's in there. And so, this is anecdotal. Yesterday, we put an ad out just to show you why it is also possible and why it will happen here. It's the sheer brain power that this zip code attracts. It is the number one zip code in the world for, you know, intellectual gladiators. You know, a gladiator wants to die in Rome, so why not die in Silicon Valley? <laughs> so this, uh, you know, we set up that. This is how we put out our, our uh, job ads. You know, it was on Kaggle, if you know, it's a, it's a machine learning site. And 18 minutes later, we got the response. It took me 30 minutes to uh, decipher this uh, CV. <laughs> uh, you see, the people are here 
the computers are here, um, so the, the open source is here, the big guys are giving their open source, and why do they give their open source? Well, because it's a race for the developer, people like us, content. Because there is one thing that we now all agree, you know, you remember Marshall McLuhan, <clears throat> first, you know, you make the tool, and then the tool shapes you, you know. Uh, well, what is the tool that we made and is now shaping us? Data. Data is our tool. We are looking at ourselves as vessels of data. And the next thing, and this is already in Silicon Valley, we look at ourselves as code. You know, uh, you know as the previous speaker said, we can, code is great because we can edit it. We can knock it out. We can rewrite it. And, you know, we just need the data and the code. <clears throat> also, governments are aligned, or were aligned. Uh, uh, so, you know, precision medicine is really, you know, everyone agrees this is the next thing. But we are, fair, we are fighting, as consumers, an unfair fight for our medical records. But also this, you know, this is actually another illusion, these medical records. Because basically, 50% is self-reported information. And mostly people lie to their doctor because they want to get out of there and have a clean health bill. You know, they're pushing the rock up the mountain. 20% are biomarkers in blood and urine, biopsies. So this 30% only left. 10% are scans because you don't do it that often. And by the time you look at it from a year ago, they don't mean anything anymore. 20% are doctor notes. And this is what every doctor and every patient complains about. It's the battle against Epic, against these big, you know, accountancy systems for compliance and covering your ass. <laughs> and that, that takes up all the work. And why would we want to have these medical records? They're not even interesting because you know, 70% we can do ourselves, and the rest we scrape. Because the, you know, these, these three, you know, like Glimpse is a company, it's a couple of years old, they scrape. You tell them like, there is my medical record, there is my medication, there is that, they scrape it for you. After two years, they were bought by Apple for $200 million. They only raised one million in seed. So you see, this is possible. And when we do this, we move the information chain from the medical industrial complex to the consumer. We make a, a seller's market into a buyer's market. Now, another thing, everything that doesn't learn will disappear. So I've got another slide, which is, I, I'm making another slide, but I can tell you, the, ne the next slide is all yellow. Because what is yellow? Yellow is unsupervised. Not any anything that is unintelligent will disappear, that cannot learn will disappear, but anything that is unsupervised, uh, that is supervised, will also have to disappear. Because again, it requires humans. And carbon-based units are not scalable. Now, I think if we want to build an agent, a robot doctor, so how will we go about it? Well, first of all, we have chatbots already. You know, we had them for a long time. They do, you know, pretty good job. Uh, you know, like we always try to fool them and, you know, this, but they are not vertical intelligence. Vertical intelligence are the virtual assistants, you know, uh, Amy, Clara, uh, Melody, you know, they are uh, the best to use random forests in a bit of, uh, or conditional random fields. Um, it's okay, but what I'm talking about is intelligent agents, because intelligent agents for me is an agent that is vertically intelligent. And I believe in elaboration theory, that you start with a simple and you build it up into complexity. So you take one intelligent agent and another and another and another and you put them together and that's how you are going to build a robot doctor. Her artificial intelligence, that's again carbon chauvinism. So.
let's look at the um, learning uh, uh, methodologies that you need for an agent like that. Of course, you will need unsupervised learning uh, in the sense that it says, so the, let's say that the, the agent does blood markers. So there are 300 to 500 blood markers that are really important, all the rest is. Uh, actually, you could do already with 100. But let's take the 300. You take a million people and 300 bo uh, blood markers. Well, the machine is going to find clusters. The machine is going to find machine-generated patterns. It's going to say, like, look, um, the, your ferritin is normal, you know, because it's be, you know, between 30 and 300 nanograms per milliliter. You are at 162, it's completely normal, but we found that people who have C288Y mutation, a storage mutation in, your, uh, in the fifth uh, chromosome arm, that uh, you have to go for optimal and not normal. So you should be less than 30. You know, this is machine-generated wisdom, you know. So um, I think for a doctor it's also interesting. If he, he doesn't have to do all that epic, and he can really look at these new patterns and validate them, like astronomers give a name to a star. You know, that's where the consumer and a doctor have a new conversation. Also supervised, of course, supervised, we need labels and we need classification, and that has to be done by humans. Um, the same with uh, uh, reinforced learning, because before you put an agent out there, you have to give it to doctors to tell them, like, don't do that, don't do, you know, do this, because we want to be compliant also. Memory-based, so there are great memory-based networks now, because, you see, if you, if you base it in transit memory, it's a sort of a memory also. And uh, semantic embeddings, word, word to vec. So it's something great that Google has really, you know, give them credit where they need to be. They should spend some more uh, time on uh, email. But uh, so word to vec was really great. Word to vec, it comes from cosine similarities. From you know, in computational linguistics, we thought for a while, and it's still true, that the cosine angles of a word give it a special weighting where we could put them in proximity and clouds and semantic trees with other words. Then there came latent semantics. Now, word for vec is a lot more easy because you take 100 million texts you put that in the machine in a neural net, two layers. You put it in the machine, and uh, basically, the machine puts that into a vector space with thousands of dimensions, which then will reduce the dimensions, give every word a unique vector in that vector space, and then it's going to look for other vectors that are close to it. And I can tell you, it really works. So you really have the sometimes the, um, uh, because it's going to look for the closest vector. So it knows some, it's a bit like a student. They know what they're talking about, but you know, you have to find out how. And one-shot learning, you know, that's, um, so we are working on this one because human beings, sometimes you can tell them one thing and they can extrapolate into many other things. They can generalize it. That's difficult for a machine. Uh, algorithms, well, you know, clustering, classification, regression, the difference is discrete or continuous values, um, structural matching, case-based reasoning, so uh, structural elaboration and substitute, all these algorithms are pretty well, you know, understood, and we use them, because basically in machine learning, so we use all sorts of programming languages, because, you know, like, Torch now uses OOLA, but the main thing is Python, you know, everything is in Python now. So, also people of my generation, finally we have left MATLAB to Python, yeah. <laughs> which was a hard one. <laughs> um, a conversational search. While you are actually uh, 
conversing with that robot doctor, uh, you don't have to type a lot because you know, it's going to predict actually your next question or it's going to predict. So it's a bit like a gun, you know, you have one answer in the chamber, but like six, uh, sorry, five in the Mac, you know, and it predicts these five answers already. And you know, for instance, when you tell it, uh, what is, is my LDL of 100, is that good? The machine first, no. It's going to predict, why not? What is the formula? What is the relationship with HDL? What is the relationship with triglycerides? How can you get it down? Uh, what is important for you to know? So these answers are already ready in a now memory. You know. uh, speaker analysis, that's a, 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 differ, a difficult one. We're looking for a, a better word for this because we have to know how much the patient actually understands you know, when he, when, or, or the consumer understands about something. Um, how many times do I have left? Because, oh yeah, all right. Ooh. All right. A linguistic authority. So I'm in the company, the linguistic authority. So, uh, and uh, so we are, we are using Bobby test. The Bobby test of uh, Facebook is very easy. You just put it into a big corpora of text and you know, you see how much you score. Winograd, that's really difficult because Winograd tests are you know, the disambiguation of the pronouns. But we also have, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of grammars out there, construction grammars. And construction grammars are actually grammars where you don't teach that to students, you teach that to machines. I have to... The brain, luckily NIH has done 20 years of semantic trees, not because they want to understand medicine, but for reimbursement. So each of these trees with millions of concepts, you just convert the code into a word and then you conduct, you know, with word to vec, you make semantic trees. You have to speed up a bit. Yeah, that's how we made the, uh, the personality of the machine, you know. Uh, I'll, I'll skip that because that's too much technical things. The market. The market, the biggest market here is, uh, you know, genomics is a very big market. And I think with blood markers, with omics is a very big market. Because people want their results now. So we have, and the next slide will show you, it's a, you know, we now have like one million genomes, a lot of in research, I think only less than 50,000 have been interpreted. So people now have to, have to, in China, they have to wait nine months, you know, <laughs> like a baby for, for the result of your genome. So it's time for machines to be put in. And it's pretty easy because we have already uh, a lot of computational genomics in there. Uh, CRISPR will boost the personal genome, you know. So this is going, going up and up. We foresee by 2025, historical rate, probably one billion genomes. And of course, we are running out of humans. And uh, data becomes a revenue stream. And uh, every, co every company that is now a service company is in the kill box of the 21st century. Because if you don't sell your data very soon, you, know, you will not be able to compete. And PlayStation is my main example because wherever you put a PlayStation in the wall and you start to do stuff on it, all that data is sold. Like for instance, we play a lot of Grand Theft Auto. Who do you think buys that data? Well, Rockstar Games, the, ga the guys who make <laughs> Grand Theft Auto. So there's now 18% of the, uh, the, the income of PlayStation is the data, is us playing with Grand Theft Auto. And uh, so, and if, Grand, if Rockstar would one day say, we won't sell you, we, we won't buy it anymore, they'll sell it to the competition. I like to think of health in future as a, an, uh, an, an asset category, you know, a bit like flying on an airplane. So I, I took my own life expectancy in the uh, um, uh, Harvard uh, life expectancy calculator 
And you know, if I just do nothing, it's 73.9. But if I am proactive, it's 89.3. So that's, that's a big difference. I think, and this is going to be very important for, for our century now. We are not going to study health as it is, but health as it changes. And in order for that to happen, we need to think continuously and have it in our own hands. Our personal baselines are going to be important. Also, the clinical study of one. And we will be going from the normal to the optimal. We're not going to be in more interested in the normal anymore. We'll go for optimal. And, you know, just very quickly, in 10 seconds, the difference between discrete and continuous functions. <laughs> uh, so a bank account is a, con is a discrete function. You put money in, you take money out. Take money in, money out. It's a bit like how we see healthcare now. We walk on the street, we fall down. Some people put us in a, in, in a thing with sirens. They bring us to a hospital. They treat us like children. They speak you know, child language to us. Then put us full of monitors, and then they put us out to the street, and we don't even know what actually happened. That's a discrete function. We have to go to a continuous function with only two singularities, birth and death, and all the rest must be continuous. I think our grandchildren will probably not understand anymore that there was a time when we only did interventions or medications during the disease instead of before. So this is actually what this century is going to bring, I think. And my last one, more is more, because the doctors keep telling us that once a year, our blood test is enough. Well, let's put that statistically to the test, because their argument is false positives. OK, when I go once a year, let's say for one blood marker, my chance of being right, of, being, of, of buying the truth, is 50%. Now, if I go six times a year, my chance is 1% of being wrong. If I go every month, my risk disappears. So statistically, this does not make sense, apart from the notion that for consumers it also doesn't make sense, because we've been telling consumers that more is more for 100 years now. And I'd like to end with, uh, you know, uh, my uh, credentials. Sorry, I'm slightly over time, but thank you very much. Because we have a smaller audience today, we can do five minutes of Q&A. So I'll begin again here. How do we move towards the model you spoke of, the continuous model? How do we get from where we are today to there? And once Walter has kindly answered that, we'll move to questions from the audience. I think uh, you know it's something that is going on, and the um, so it's the empowerment of consumers, and you know once the consumer the, when a consumer decides something, it's sudden. You know they go to sleep, they wake up, and they change their mind, and the complete industry follows. So this is actually what's going on, I think, and I, I agree with the previous speaker, uh, Brad. I think five years. I, I think like three years. You know. Because genomics will take them, uh, because you know, people understand, well, even if they don't understand what CRISPR-Cas9 is, they understand like knocking out something bad, how much does it cost? You know? Brad, can you give Brad the microphone? And can I have Brad here for a moment, please? A little impromptu, but that's uh, a benefit of having a small number. So you say within, did you say within the next three to five years, you said the next three years. So you see a consumer industry being born. It's being born now because you see, wellness, it didn't exist. I started Scanadu in 2011 when I said that uh, mobile health was going to be health. Nobody believed it. So, but now it is there. Like, um, wellness is, if you're now going to, we went to Stanford campus and asked students what the vital signs were. Well, they said, like, sleep, wait. It was like, shit, that's not a vital sign. For them, it is. <laughs> and Brad, do you have any, what, what did you learn from that talk? I know I've just thrown you totally in the deep end, but what was most interesting for you during that talk? 
No, it was a brilliant talk. Um, you know, one of my hypotheses is, I mean, where is this gonna be born and live in the industry construct right now? One of my, one of my notions is that it's unlikely that this revolution is gonna be led by the incumbents in healthcare. Um, and that one of, my, one of my beliefs right now is that um, the, one, the one giant industry uh, with which this is incredibly well aligned is life insurance. And life insurance has an opportunity, I think, to birth this industry. Um, and I think the future of health and healthcare is actually um, gonna be much more like wealth management and asset management, yeah. like you suggested, than, than what healthcare looks like to, today. So I would be ready for a black swan yeah. about where this where yeah. this emerges. No, I think you're right with uh, the, uh, certainly right with life insurance because you see, it won't be life insurance anymore, it will just be insurance, That's right. you know, parametric insurance will be so much for health, so much for life, and you can, you know, we're all DJs now, we're mixed, you know. Hey Brad, I appreciate you stepping on stage there and I'll give the mic back to Martin. So any questions from the audience? I have another question I just yeah, have to sure. ask. Yeah, yeah. Are you trying to eliminate doctor? I won't, I won't say trying to eliminate. Do you predict you're going to eliminate physicians, GPs from the equation here? Uh, no, there aren't any anymore. <laughs> uh, so it's like the priests, you know, like we just we pretend they're out there, we just call one. Will Nobody's a, coming. Will you use a doctor for diagnostics? No, um, I think the, uh, what I foresee is the same we had in banking. So, and by the way, you know, in banking, now by putting in all the ATM machines, uh, so we created a space for private bankers where they can talk to, because basically rich people would like to talk about their money as a therapy, you know? So they can now go to uh, private bankers and the rest they do on, uh, on just the ATM machines. So, and the first robo-advisors came, Wealthfront was the first robo-advisor. So in 2008, now everyone that is actually doing stock as a consumer, small stock, it's all robo-advisors. There are no brokers for small advisors anymore, or if they are, they'll have to look for another job. You know, the Wolf of Wall Street doesn't exist anymore. It's all sysadmins. Um, and uh, so, interesting enough, these robo-advisors, so they, because we had to, you know, for a long time ago I was a banker, I had to go to a FINRA exam, which is diabolically difficult actually. And so these robo-advisors, so they are not actually regulated by FINRA. They are regulated directly by the SEC, by the Security and Exchange Commission. That would mean that robo-doctors would not be regulated by an exam, a national exam, or by a state but they would be regulated by HHS. Although they have to change the second H because it's human, <laughs> probably HSS for silicon. But uh, I think this, this is certainly coming. Highly appreciated. Oh, thank thank you. you for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.